Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to our weekly Family Connections. We are going to be talking about a very exciting topic today, which is pre-K enrollment and our dual language program. Uh, we have quite a few uh, panelists with us today, so lots of experts on the line to answer your questions um, as we um, get ready to start our 21-22 school year. I'm Rachel McLean. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Learning and Innovation with the school district. And joining us today, we have Kanita Rhodes. She is our primary uh, principal and Katie Cade is our intermediate principal. Uh, we also have Courtney Boyd. She, she Courtney, is our elementary um, math and STEM coordinator. Uh, Jesus Gomez is with us. He is our director of equity. So if you have any language uh, support needs, please um, feel free to message that in the chat and Jesus can offer that support. Uh, we also have Kathy Scott is our Director of Federal Programs. So since we are talking about um, some of our dual language programs, uh, Kathy is here uh, with any uh, question support. And finally, we have Tiffany Bear. She is uh, with JETS, our community partner. And so we are excited to get started. Um, we've had questions that have been submitted from parents. And so we, um, and, and typical questions that we get asked a lot. So we'll be going through those, but at any time as we're talking today um, that you have questions, please feel free to enter those into the chat feature and or the Q and A feature. And we will answer as many of your questions online um, as possible uh, during our 30 minutes together. So we will, um, we will go ahead and get started. So um, first of all, uh, Kanita and Courtney, do you want to just talk about um, pre-K enrollment, kindergarten enrollment? Um, what's our timeline? What's our plans? So we have our pre-K and kindergarten roundup set for May the 10th through the 14th, that, that whole week. And at that point, we will be enrolling um, new students to the district, both in pre-K and um, in kindergarten. And so if you were a student in pre-K, <clears throat> even through JETS this year, then you will not have to um, re-enroll for kindergarten. That's a positive, but if you have never been enrolled in the district, um, then you can do so. Um, then that kind of helps us get a get a feel for how many kindergarten and pre-K teachers we need. And then um, also it allows us to, to test those students for our dual language program, which we can talk about later or whenever you want me to. Okay, so let's talk about pre-K for a minute. Um, is pre-K eligibility based? And if so, how do children qualify for pre-K? Sure. So there's there's several ways that a student can qualify for pre-K. First of all, it's by income. And so if you have older children and you've ever filled out um, the free and reduced lunch form, if you qualify for free or, or reduced lunch um, through the district, then you would qualify for pre-K. If your child's uh, first language is something other than English, then you will qualify, um, military qualifies, any foster care students. Um, there's, there's several qualifications for that, homeless students as well. But the main thing that um, most of the students that we get for pre-K qualify through um, our, our income-based eligibility. All right, and we have a partnership with JETS. Um, do you want to talk about that? And, and Tiffany, chime in if you uh, want to add anything in. So our partnership with JETS, um, how does that work? Okay, I'll let Courtney and, and Tiffany um, tag team with that one. Yeah, Tiffany, jump in whenever. Um, we This is our first year um, that we've partnered with JETS. Um, we have, um, and Tiffany, correct me if I'm wrong, um, over at JETS, they usually have a classroom for four-year-olds. This year, they moved their four-year-olds um, over to our campus here at Primary, and um, we have a certified teacher for Snyder um, Independent School District um, in the classroom with them, as well as a JETS um, co-teacher that's in there. So they have that benefit of having two um, adults in there with them at all times. Um, those classrooms are 
<clears throat> only for the JETS um, students. So the, the classrooms are really small. I think right now we've got what, 13, 14 kids in those classes um, with the two adults there to support. So um, Tiffany, I don't, if you wanna jump in, um, give a little bit more details about how they're integrating um, some of the JETS routines and procedures um, here with ours, that would be great. So we typically have 60 Head Start spots at the beginning of each school year, um, federally funded, of course, and we took um, all of our four-year-olds who would be age eligible for pre-K and put those children on the ISD campus, like Courtney was saying. Um, we do have the two teachers from our campus um, that are co-teaching with the ISD teachers. They These classrooms are getting both of best of both worlds really. They're getting all of the things that the ISD offers for pre-K as well as the Head Start um, things that we offer as well. A lot of the stuff is very similar. However, there are a few things that Head Start offers um, different than the ISD does. And the only difference in um, qualifying for that classroom versus the ISD's classroom is um, we have a little bit more strict guidelines as far as income goes, because we do have to follow the federal poverty guidelines versus the free and reduced lunch guidelines for that program. Okay, awesome. We've really enjoyed our partnership with JETS this year. And um, we think it's really benefiting both um, programs, but definitely benefiting our students. Um, so as a, uh, as a parent, um, how can our parents help their children be ready for pre-K? Well, if they're reading on the third grade level, that would be awesome. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, pre-K is, is such a neat environment because um, these kids, you know, 95% of them have never been in a school environment before. Just if they have been to, to the JETS program as three-year-olds or if they have come through our PPCD program. And so most of the kiddos coming to pre-K have never been in school before. But um, I, I think just, just knowing that coming in and, and being a support um, as a parent and supporting um, your your student, your child, um, in their education and being positive um, about school, um, I think that's the most important thing to to start with is is just having that positive um, attitude. Courtney, do you do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I I agree. Um, I think that it's. It's definitely harder on parents to drop their kids off um, on the first day. Um, and there's going to be tears. There, there's always tears. We're used to that. Um, we're used to the, the kids crying, the parents crying. Um, and it's okay. Um, we are here to partner with you, like Kanita just said. We're here to partner with you. Um, your kids are going to have a long educational journey here with us and and starting off on the right foot and building those relationships with you all is is very important to us so um just know that that we are here to help with with anything if it's registration um you know questions about drop off or how things work or whatever feel free to ask even if it is march already and you're already panicking about stuff feel free to reach out to us we're we're here all the time um, we did have a question come in on the chat. I think it's a good one to answer live. Um, what are the ages for kindergarten? So maybe what are the ages for pre-K and kindergarten? Um, so we, and birth dates and that kind of, get, that kind of thing that always gets a little confusing. Right, so <clears throat> uh, pre-kindergarten, they have to be four before September 1st of that school year. And so you, we will have a few kids that maybe have an August birthday or whatever that are still three, but turn, you know, that'll turn four by the end of August, as long as, as um, they're four by September 1st, then they qualify for the age part of pre-K. Uh, for kindergarten, they have to be five by September 1st um, in, in, in order to be old enough for kindergarten. Sometimes parents hold their student back 
maybe they have a late birthday in the year or whatever. And so we do have some kindergarten kids that might start <clears throat> um, kindergarten at five, but immediately turn six or, or have turned six maybe in the summer that they held back just um, because they, they're um, a younger um, child, but that, I mean, that totally depends on the parent. Um, but those are the guidelines for age for pre-K and for kindergarten. So what, does a child need to be fully potty trained and what happens if they have an accident? Courtney, would you like to address the situation? <laughs> Sure. Um, it, we, we really would like for them to be potty trained. Um, we do have some kids who, like Dr. McLean just said, have accidents. I mean, that's part of it. Um, we always ask for parents to send um, an extra change of clothes in their backpacks um, just to have um, in case of emergencies or anything like that. Our nurses um, also are really good about keeping extra clothes in case something happens. So um, we do know that there are going to be some circumstances for certain kiddos. Um, they might not be fully potty trained yet. If you have questions or concerns about that, um, just get with one of us and we can talk about your, your kid's individual situation um, and address that, you know, how we need to. Um, all right. So when they come to register for pre-K or kindergarten, really, what documents do our parents need to bring with them? to the roundup. Ooh, all right, so first of all, the student documents that they need to bring is they need to have their student's birth certificate and their social security card. You need to have those. If they don't have their social security card yet, for some reason, uh, we can um, assign them a state number until that social security number comes in. Um, but those are the two main things that we need for the students. Now the nurses will help the parents at that point with any shot records, um, any extra shots that they may need before school starts and they will give them guidance on that. So the birth certificate and the um, social security card are a must from the student. And then the shot records, um, you know, if, if you come early in May, then you have plenty of time after that um, to get everything else in order as far as um, shots and stuff. And our nurses will be here during registration to answer any questions about that. As far as parent information, we uh, require that we have a parent ID. And if you are not listed on the birth certificate um, as, as the parent, if you're a guardian or someone else um, taking care of the child and you are not on the birth certificate, then we need some sort of paperwork that says that you know, you're supposed to have that kid. Um, uh, we also need information on where you're living, whether it's a gas bill or uh, a cable bill or some other sort of bill that has your address on it so we can verify that you live um, in the district. Am I missing something, you guys? That's about all, I think, for the parent stuff as well, is a parent, a state-issued ID from the parent. Um, proof of residence. Yep, proof of residence. And then also, if you are not listed on the birth certificate, if, if you are not the person registering the student and you're not on the birth certificate, then we need some sort of documentation that, that you have access to enroll that student. Right. So uh, we've had that, some questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Tip, tip for Jess, that information is still the same. Like we also require the exact same information. The only difference is for Jets, we do require proof of income for the past 12 months. So like a W-2 form or a statement of income, um, those sort of things um, we do have to uh, take into consideration as well. Yeah, and for pre-K um, also, you know, we have to qualify you through um, that income as well. So you'll need a check stub or something that's pretty recent so that we can um, see if you qualify. If, if the child is through foster care, then you should have that letter. Military, you should have that information as well. Many, any of the other qualifications, um, as long as you have that documentation. And if you get, uh, if, if you're already on the list for pre-certification, 
um, then you automatically um, qualify for pre-K. And so those of you that are on that list, you already know that you are because um, you've received that information as well. Okay, one more quick question. How many check stubs do um, folks need to take? So a couple different standards for Snyder ISD, Canada. Yeah, we, um, we say to bring the last two um, statements that you have, the two most recent statements that you have, and that's for all the parties in your household. If there's two adults working in your household, then you've got to bring that for both from both adults. Um, and then I think Tiffany's is a little bit different. Yes, ma'am. Um, for us, we just have to have some sort of proof of the last 12 months of income. So a lot of times that'll be like their W-2 for the previous year and then a current check stub that will show their year to date. That's all we need. It's just two forms. I know that sounds like a lot, but it'll show us what we need to know for the income guidelines set out by the federal. And if I'm going to jump in for just a quick second, because I want to clarify too that the proof of income is just for incoming pre-K kids only. If you have an incoming kindergarten child, we don't need that from you. So we've had a few questions about ACE um, for our new parents to the district. ACE is an after-school program uh, that we offer. Um, it is grant funded, so I'm going to clarify just make that statement up front. Um, we are at the end of the grant cycle. We have applied for a new grant. Uh, we have not heard yet um, if we've received that grant or not. And so, um, um, you know, we'll be sending out additional information as that's coming. But at the current time, let's talk about ACE. Um, is that available to pre-K and kindergarten students? And mm -hmm. how much does it cost? Is that me? There's that nobody here. Right. Okay. So yes, ACE, ACE uh, is available for pre-K and kindergarten students. Um, there are um, maximum numbers that uh, of students, especially in pre-K, that qualify for ACE, and so they do that by need. And so that application is completely separate from the application that you'll fill out um, when enrolling your student. And uh, in the past, that application has been available over at the Stanfield, old Stanfield campus school behind the Dairy Queen on College Avenue. And so uh, they fill those out. I think ACE runs until like 6.30 in the afternoon. And the, the, the fee is, is free. There's some parent involvement, things that they ask for you to attend and, and things like that. But uh, Otherwise, it's very, it, there's a lot of enrichment that goes on with ACE. Uh, there's a lot of homework help that goes on in ACE and, and, and just some, some other extra stuff. So it's a really good um, after school program for a lot of our kiddos. I popped Anna Montoya's email into the address, uh, the chat feature. So uh, feel free, parents, to contact her directly um, with any questions you have regarding um, ACE. Um, and then one question of can they can parents enroll their child in uh, pre K um, now? Like, is it or do we need to wait till the roundup? Yeah, it's it's better if we wait till the roundup. We do not have the updated uh, paperwork and guidelines um, from the state as uh, that yet that we need, and so uh, we need to wait till May. I would encourage as many of you that you can to enroll during that week. But if some reason, if you're gonna be at Disney World or whatever in that week of May, just touch base with us and, and we can make different arrangements um, for you. We're very flexible, um, but, but we do, we, we need a lot of, of staff members helping with that roundup. And so we don't wanna prolong it too long, um, but we can make accommodations with, with whatever we need to. Okay. And a questions in the chat, uh, do parents need to bring uh, health insurance information? No, ma'am, they do not. Okay. So when they fill out registration, there's some information that's come out, comes out in online registration and that's where parents can input um, um, uh, the information for health insurance. One other question as we shift off of this, uh, we're about to start talking about dual language. Um, 
Will masks be required or is that an option and will virtual be available for kindergarten or not? So I'm gonna answer this one uh, if you guys don't care. Um, we are currently operating under the most recent guidelines. Um, so when the governor changed the mask mandate uh, a few weeks ago, it, uh, schools um, could opt out of it, but it took a board action. And so our board uh, currently uh, has opted to wait until the April board meeting to review the information again, as far as um, you know, our infection rate and those kind of things. We are desperately, desperately hoping that by fall of 21, um, that we are to where we can operate our schools in a normal fashion. Um, our teachers and our students be back into a, a regular rhythm. Um, as everybody knows, the pandemic has um, put a kink in a lot of our plans. And so that's what, you know, at the current time, we're operating under those guidelines. Um, by August, you know, hopefully we have this behind us and we're able to come back to school in a normal fashion. Um, as far as offering virtual instruction, we are, um, um, unless TEA or T Texas Education Agency or the legislature makes some kind of change uh, at the current time, the option for school districts to offer virtual instruction will expire at the end of the school year. So I feel like that change may be coming, but uh, we'll decide as a district uh, later on. Um, we do know that we have seen the best benefit of in-person instruction uh, rather than online instruction, especially for our young ones. And so we're hoping that, again, we're able to return to school in a completely normal fashion. Uh, but great question, thank you. Um, uh, and no, we are not about planning on starting. I gotta say one more thing about registering. Okay. okay. Um, whenever you come to register, there will be some questions about any allergies or any medical conditions, any medications that your student takes. And so the nurses are available to get that information. So we all are on the same page with that. And so if they have a peanut allergy, um, not only does their teacher know and the nurses are very aware, but the cafeteria people know. And so we have that plan in place for those students. And so any, any of those type of questions, medical, um, asthma, diabetes, any of those things will be addressed whenever you guys um, register your student. Right, yes. And we are not planning on starting the school year late. Um, that was another question in the chat. Uh, our calendar has been released. It's on our website. I'll pop a link into that in just a minute so everybody will have the calendar um, uh, easily available. Um, but we are starting school in August uh, if nothing doesn't transpire. Um, all right, let's talk about dual language. Very exciting program we have in the district. So um, Kanita and Courtney and Katie, um, what is our dual language program and who participates in dual language and why is it beneficial? Well, I'll start off and then they'll, and then whatever I don't um, remember, they can chime in and, and add to it. So you guys got to pay attention. Our, our dual language, our two-way dual language, uh, the first cohort of that, these kids will be going into fifth grade next year. And so that is been, that was the first cohort of our dual language two-way, which means we have English speaking students in the classroom learning Spanish and Spanish speaking students in the same classroom learning English. And so we start with our Spanish students in pre-K. Uh, they come to pre-K in the span in a Spanish setting, uh, starting to learn English um, in pre-K, but our English speaking kids do not um, enroll in the program until kindergarten. And at this time, that is the only time that they can enroll in the dual language program is coming into kindergarten. And so we have some guidelines in place for that. First of all, parents have to attend or, and, and it, it's probably gonna be on Zoom um, this year but informational meetings as to our expectations for that program and um, the guidelines, what our procedures are, um, the expectations for not only the students, but for the parents, this is, it's, it is an accelerated program. And so we do do um, a test on your students to make sure that they are kindergarten ready. And by that, they should know colors, 
They should know some shapes. They should be they should be very familiar with numbers, letters, and some sounds. They should be able to write their name, um, those type of things. Because if they come into kindergarten and are very behind in those things, it's going to be really hard for them to keep up with an accelerated program learning a second language as well. And so our goal uh, is not for them to be um, Spanish literate by the end of kindergarten, but it, it's a process. And so uh, it, hopefully our goal by, is by the end of fifth grade, then they will have a pretty good background of, of their second language, but also be um, very um, advanced in their first language. Okay, you guys take it from there. Uh, before um, Katie jumps in, um, Katie and I are both, we both have um, kids in the program. Um, and so we kind of have um, the perspective of an educator and the perspective of a parent. Um, the parent meetings that Kanita mentioned um, just a little bit ago, we'll have three, we normally have three separate meetings. Um, I know schedules are super busy in the spring. Um, I think this year I pulled them up on our calendar. Um, the first one will be April um, 22nd um, at 6. Um, the next one will be April 29th, and then the last one will be May 6th. Um, we can drop those in the chat here in just a second also. Um, and like she said, last year we did all of them on Zoom, and it worked out um, very well. Um, so, Kate, Katie, you want to add anything before we move on? I would just add that, you know, as an English speaker, the spots are limited. So like she mentioned, you're going to be tested. And so then the committee will evaluate those test results and depending on the number of Spanish speakers, they have to have partners in this program. That's how they work together to learn the language and help each other. And so we have to even out those numbers. And so depending on our numbers, um, it'll be limited. So not everybody that applies gets in um, and it's kind of that, it's an acceptance process. So just be prepared for that. So why are students only allowed to enter in kindergarten and have we made exceptions to that in the past? Um, the reason that, that they are only accepted in kindergarten is because, like I said, it is a process. When English speakers come in, they get their reading in their native language and their math in, in English. And then science and social studies is done in Spanish. And so and then they have a language of the day. So uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday are Spanish days, which means when the teacher says, okay, let's get up and go to the restroom. Let's go to the lunch line. You know, what, what are we doing today? That's all in, in Spanish. And then the other days opposite of those will be in English. And so they start developing some conversational Spanish uh, like I said, their science and social studies is in Spanish. And so um, there's benchmarks that kids need to, to make as they go through that program. Um, if, if you try to enroll a student in first or second grade and they have not been in a true two-way dual language program, um, <clears throat> they're gonna be very behind and they're gonna be, become very frustrated because it's an accelerated program. Um, and so, uh, what was the other question that you said? Uh, if we have seen, we have seen very few programs th that are like ours. Um, most students that come that have been in a two-way program are Spanish speakers. We have had, we haven't had any English speakers come from another program to where we could actually say that they were in a true, uh, two-way dual language program that we could easily just slot them in um, to that grade level. We haven't had that yet, but um, if they do come from that program, then of course we would look at that and we, we wanna do what's best for, for the student, you know, for any student. <clears throat> okay, so um, I think you mentioned that they make a commitment to stay in the program through fifth grade. So Katie or Miss Kate, as they are moving on through from, from primary up to intermediate, uh, we have something exciting happening next year for our fifth grade dual language, but um, like what's the intent? And as they stay in the program through fifth grade, um, like what's the intent once they complete a program and um, do they have to take Spanish in high school after that? Uh, well, the intent is for them to be, you know, biliterate. 
by the end of fifth grade. Um, our students, we had talked about maybe progressing this into junior high. It's it's depends on staffing. We have to have qualified staff to continue that. We would love to do that. Um, but it's very important to, to me for them to commit because as I mentioned earlier, you know, we partner kids, we have to balance out our English speakers and our Spanish speakers because the program uses tons of partner work um, through their languages. And so if we have someone that, you know, signs up and then two years later, they're like, and eh, we don't really want to do this, then it really affects the classroom because those kids are depending on each other to learn because that's how they progress through this program. And so we really want you to be committed and also to encourage your student through the program because it, as a parent, it can be frustrating when your child is learning a new language. It's very challenging and it's hard and it's easy to say, well, let's just forget it. And so it's very important as a parent that you're supportive and you push them and encourage them because they are going to have times that they're frustrated. My daughter is in kindergarten this year in it and she'll even say, oh, it's Spanish day today. She struggles with it. She's doing okay, um, but it's an adjustment and she's going to learn because I have a fourth grader that's in it and I can see the progress. And so just remember that it is a, it's not going to be super easy and you're going to have to really encourage your kid and be supportive at home. And then the benefit now <laughs> is that when they get into high school, they are able to um, exempt the language requirement for graduation. So that's a long range of benefit when we're talking to parents of pre-K and kindergartners, but nevertheless, still a benefit. Um, let's see, we have, we are out of time. Actually, we're a minute over. So I'm going to pop into the chat some links um, that we have uh, for registration information, uh, just general school calendar, parent school, parent square app, um, so forth. So, uh, and we have one other question that has popped up in the chat. Um, when, you're not in, your child is not entered into Skyward, which is our student management system, until they actually bring the information to enroll. And so um, we, once you complete pre-K or kindergarten roundup, you'll have access to a, a Skyward um, login. And as a parent throughout your child's career in Snyder ISD, you can check attendance and grades and, and so forth. Um, you'll see information in this chat uh, this information I've just popped into the chat there uh, regarding our parent square communication handbook supply list all of those so keep those links handy um, over the next few weeks you'll be seeing a lot of information populating on our website and if you're not a, a part of the Snyder ISD Facebook family or the Instagram family please uh, consider adding that to your social media because we communicate a lot of the great stuff that happens in our district through our social media platforms. So I uh, apologize for being a couple minutes over, but we've had a lot of great interaction. We will be back at uh, five o'clock today uh, with um, this group of panelists. And we always have different questions come in. So if you're able to join us again, please do so. Otherwise, join us every week for Family Connections at, two uh, at 12 and at five on Tuesday. So thank you. Have a great week. <laughs>